ejército del Ebro, rumba la rumba la rumba la, el ejército del Ebro, rumba la rumba la rumba la, una noche el río pasó. But 40% of Madrid at least has voted for the Catholic right. And yet this is the town, the city, filled with refugees, virtually abandoned by its own army, which will turn out to stop Franco for the first time in the last week of October and the first week of November 1936. Everyone around the world is reading the reports of the press. They're all in Madrid. They're all there to report the fall of Madrid. And as Franco gets nearer, he announces the date of occupation. He sets up the order for the parade. His troops set up the judicial procedure of who they'll execute. They have the food lined. They have special arrangements for mass to be said. The whole occupation has been laid out. And General Varela announces the attack, and they go into the attack. And at this stage, the people in Madrid are on their own. And all around the world, people who hoped that this republic might at least withstand are watching the fall of this one bastion of active defence against the growth of fascism in Europe. Countries all over Europe have fallen to the right, and have fallen to the extreme right, and have fallen to fascism and nobody has managed to stop them, and few have fought, except in Spain. And at this point in Spain, it becomes Madrid. And that first help arrives around the end of the first week, and it's in the shape of the international brigades. And to the people of Madrid, who have barely held off Franco as he eats his way into the city, the key battle takes place in the two days before in the Casa de Campo, this great park on the west and northwest of Madrid, and they have barely held him. The government have fled down to Valencia. And suddenly, I remember a man telling me in 1994, he went up with his mother to the front lines where their houses up near where the university is had all been shelled to see could they rescue some stuff. And there was still some shelling going on that Sunday morning and he and his mother stood in a doorway, he was holding her hand. And then from the wrong side, from the Madrid side, they heard the sound of trained marching feet and of course, your first reaction is the enemy have broken through. But then you hear the sound of cheering. You say, cheering? Who could it be? And as they get nearer, they can hear the people shouting, the Russians, the Russians, los Rusos, los Rusos. And up come the first battalions of the new International Brigade, the 11th Brigade, dressed in overalls with the machine guns. They're from all over the world. Six or seven of them, at least, are British. One of them is Churchill's nephew. They're led by a Hungarian. And you have the first truly international army. Something unique in history that has never been quite equaled. And which brings people like Charlie Donnelly and Frank Ryan and all that they bring to Madrid. Mm. Franco eventually has to settle down to a siege of Madrid. And Madrid becomes the first significant city in the world where mass bombing of civilians is established as a norm. And this breaks all concept of what is allowed in a war by any country up to now. The famous 1920s Convention on Aerial Warfare have limited the use of attacks on civilians. The shock of Madrid to Franco is so great that his German advisers send back word that it looks like this war is lost. And in Franco and Mola's rear guard, the feeling is that they've taken a ch uh, chance here and that their chance has not come off. When Franco makes an attempt to cut off Madrid from its vital supply line to Valencia, the Valencia Road, and this becomes the battle of the valley of the river Harama. And this battle draws in huge forces on both sides, huge by Spanish standards. Afterwards, Writing about the whole war, General Lister was to say, the great general on the Republican side and the leading communist, one of the two leading communist generals, it was the most brutal because of its tenaciousness, and the most bloody, the numbers involved, the small area, how long it went on. And this is a battle where in the opening phases, Franco's Moors and elite units really pull off two wonderful coups capturing bridges and managed to get to the dominating heights from where their artillery can fire. Heights which are assaulted and 
which are defended with great bravery and attacked with great bravery by both sides, but remain in Franco's hands. The British battalion, which has huge Irish, relatively big Irish proportion, including the first company, which is almost entirely ex-IRA in the words of one Manchester British volunteer, uh, are sent down to defend the very end of the line. And at the end of the second week of February 1937, they bear the brunt of the Franco's attempt to swing around the forces of Arama. But the British battalion, Scots, Welsh, English and Irish are largely on their own and they're attacked in waves. And at a key moment on the second day, their machine guns are captured because a British company led by a communist of political reliability, but a man without this kind of battlefield experience cracks and the commander withdraws the company and leaves the machine guns open. And the enemy, who are first-class soldiers, spot their opportunity and move in. And the guns are then turned against their own side. This, this forces the retreat, and the conditions of this retreat are terrible. The line breaks. But before the line breaks completely that night, Jock Cunningham and Frank Ryan manage to rally the troops, and they march back singing the one song that everybody knows, the internationality. And by the time night falls, they have not only recovered their lines, but they've driven the enemy a little further back. And it was that extraordinary capacity to take these utterly unreasonable casualties by people who had never been properly trained, who were never properly armed, who weren't properly supported, who didn't have an effective ambulance service, but who stayed where they were. And when they lost the ground, had the courage more courage than guns to go back, and that were able to drive back the best soldiers in Spain and save Madrid. And the following that, we have the attacks where the Irish who've gone over to the American Link Battalion on this same issue of the row of being in the same unit with the British, which has come up, and includes Charlie Donnelly, who didn't want to go and has argued against it, but respects the democratic vote. And he will then be sent into battle with the Lincolns. The Lincolns are equally idealistic, equally untrained. They're given their guns on their way up to the front. And they take them out and they have to use their shirts to wipe the grease off the guns. And they stop in the dusk at a hill and they're allowed to fire three rounds into the hill to get the idea of a gun and the idea of a ricochet. But that's not even enough time to know what the sights in your actual gun are like, to know your weapon. And it's no use when you're under fire and lying on your belly and scrabbling for ammunition. And a lot of it might be of different calibres. And you have to find the bullets that will fit in just to keep firing. And all you've got is a rifle that may only be firing one shot at a time against machine guns dug in. And that's the attack they're sent in on the 23rd. Charlie Donnelly survived that. Many others don't. And then the 27th, they're sent back into another terrible engagement. And one of the enemy, one of the Foreign Legion, Spanish soldiers watching, describes much later, quite recently in a TV interview, how he found it heartbreaking to watch it because he said, I knew the machine guns we'd set up and the killing zone that was there and there was no way you could cross it. And our orders were to hold our fire and let these guys advance well away from their trenches into the open, into the middle, into no man's land. And you knew those guns were going to walk up and massacre them. And I said, I didn't know they were Spanish, or they weren't Spanish, I thought they were. And I'm looking at people like me of my own age, and at this stage of the battle, I'm sick of it. And I really don't want any of this. On the other hand, he said, you have to face it. They're coming for you. And then the guns open up, and it is a massacre. And Charlie is one of a huge number of dead. Charlie was unlucky. He was a lot more advanced and his body was found quite close to the fascist lines, which is why it couldn't be found for a number of days. And it was, of course, Peter O'Connor and the, and the Power Brothers from Waterford, I think, who went and brought it in. And significantly, they describe burying it. Not, they don't mention any of the burials being in any of the normal communal graves for uh, international brigaders, which would normally be a short distance behind the lines. And there's no reason to think that that's in Morata Cemetery because they simply describe burying Charlie out under an olive tree. And that sounds like they left a stone and a note, maybe a little helmet. 
So if we're looking for Charlie Donnelly today, and you stand in the right olive grove and you just look out, you're probably looking at mm -hmm. the olive tree with Charlie Donnelly still there. The idea for a monument to Charlie Donnelly in Harama began probably back in in 2006, 2007, as a consequence of uh, a group of people who had went out to Harama, to the Harama walk, a walk initiated by Sevi Montero and Bob Doyle around the, the Harama battlefield. I myself had been going out to Rama for a number of years to my interest on, on, on Charlie Donnelly and trying to ascertain information about him. There had very little information about Charlie Donnelly and that, uh, there was a stone done by Dungannon Council, to, a memorial in Dungannon to him. And I did 2007 uh, at a dinner in, in Madrid, some people were discussing the idea, you know, that you know, there's nothing happening. There doesn't it doesn't appear to be any particular memorial to the Irish volunteers, brigaders who died out in in Harama, and uh, the idea of them was flagged up by Maureen Shields that maybe there was something that we could do. And Rivas Council was very much interested in in uh, linking up with Dungannon to do the project and they would be very much interested because a large part of the battlefields lies within their council area. Last year we had uh, we had given a commitment, like as also as a friend of the Charlie Donnelly group, give a commitment to Revis that the project would be done. We knew certainly knew we had the will to do it. Um, it was just a case of the logistics and, and then garnering the support and the finance to do it. And after a series of meetings among the group who had gone out and who had been going out since probably the early 2000, you know, we came up with the concept of sponsoring a stone. And the idea of bringing stones out from Ireland came from a, an original memorial that we had, sort of temporary memorial we had built out there in 2000 and 2006, 2007. And the idea was to take a stone from each county given that each county in Ireland had a brigade, uh, there was brigaders from each county in Ireland, who, many who died, and we decided that we'd take a stone out from there, and to that end we'd take it from significant historical and social, political sectors of each county. Um, we'd build those into a memorial wrapped around with stones taken from the Rama battlefield, and again, those stones would come from significant areas of the battlefield. That was the idea, and the the means to fund that was was came from a very successful night we held in the teachers club of music and poetry, and talk, and uh, a large number of people came on board with the idea, and suddenly we had garnered a huge amount of support and goodwill towards the project. And with a little great assistance from, we couldn't name them all here because there were so many, but um, the main people who would have been involved in it would have been Maureen and Eileen Shields, who liaised with various people throughout the country in regarding stones and collecting of stones. Other people's up within the Tyrone Coal Island area who secured the main stone, cleaned it down and delivered it to Kildare for, for shipment. So people like that and other people who for their with their own knowledge of particular areas in Ireland and particular counties garnered stones from, from, from each of these places. Like for instance out in Ackill Island in Mayo it was Tommy Patton, who was a brigade who was killed. Stone came from that area. We successfully gathered all the stones, packaged them and shipped them over to Madrid. And all we had wanted one was the weather to be to be kind to us. That it was not. Uh, thankfully, Reavers Council, who had, who had done the base and the foundation for the memorial, had come up with uh, 
cover for to so we could build during the time, but it was it made it very difficult. Collecting the stones out on the Rama battlefield was 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 it was probably it was a nightmare with heavy clay and muck and all tramping through fields, much like it was in February thirty seven. We had many offers from probably fifteen to twenty people who would said they would like to go out and build it, but. We just threw them out of a, a hat, the names that, that went out. And I'd like to mention uh, Kevin Maguire, and Sean Welsh, Stevie Moore, Rob Jackson, Gabriel Cleary. And these are the people who built it in, in, a say, in very difficult conditions and managed to get it completed in time. As I say, the idea was that the 32 stones, one from each county, would be wrapped around by the stones from the battlefield, symbolising the, uh, that the Spanish earth holds the, 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 these memories and the, of these people dear. As I say, it was, on, it was completed in time and unveiled in a, a large guy on a Saturday on the 27th of, of February 17th. 73 years to the day that he died. I myself was, was, was delighted to be involved in the project because as I say, I'd been interested in Charlie Donnelly from, from a very young age and, and over the years I'd discovered quite a lot of other people who had been going out there on their own, just looking around and trying to find out what they could find out. And suddenly for everyone involved over the years, this was the moment, this was the moment that suddenly marked these men's lives, and particularly Charlie Donnelly's lives, Charlie Donnelly's life. In a meeting recently with um, the Donnelly family, Harry Owens and myself, we had been out to talk with them and chat with them, and they had thanked us for, for doing that project, and it wasn't... A, particularly either of us two that did it, it was a large number of people who, who did it. And they, I suppose this was the, the, the finest gratitude and thanks you could have received for completing the project. And it was directed to all the people who were involved, all the friends of the Charlie Donnelly, that they now had a place to go to visit their uncle. Somewhere they could stand and remember and something that marked an end to silence.
trying to fundraise to build a cairn which will be erected in Kharaba, 27th of February, which is the anniversary of the death of Charlie Donnelly. It's very fitting that we commemorate Charlie Donnelly on that day, not only because of the anniversary, but he, Spain and the Spanish Civil War has often been referred to as a poet's war. And Charlie Donnelly embodied everything that was good and noble and sacrificial about the people who fought. And many of them died, of course, in Spain. And it's for everyone in the Connolly Column. I'd like to thank in advance the musicians, the poets, and Harry Owens, who give a, a short talk on this as well. And uh, I'd like to again thank you all for turning out tonight. And uh, I really hope you enjoy yourselves. Thank you. <laughs> My house was called the House of Flowers because everywhere you looked, geraniums burst. It was a house beautiful with its dogs and children. Do you remember Raul? Do you remember Rafael? Federico, do you remember? From under the ground, my balconies on which the light of June drowned flowers in your mouth. Brother, my brother, Everything loud with big voices, the salt of merchandise. One morning, all that was burning. One morning, the bonfires leapt out of the earth, devouring human beings. And from then on, fire, gunpowder from then on. And from then on, blood. Bandits with planes and moors. Bandits with finger rings and duchesses. Bandits with black friars giving blessings came through the sky to kill the children. And the blood of children ran through the streets without fuss, like children's blood. Jackals that the jackals would despise. Stones that the dry thistle would bite on and spit out. Vipers that the vipers would abominate. Face to face with you, I have seen the blood of Spain tower like a tide to drown you in one wave of pride and knives. Treacherous generals, see my dead house. Look at broken Spain. From every house, burning metal flows instead of flowers. From every socket of Spain, Spain emerges, and from every dead child, a rifle with eyes. And from every crime, bullets are born, which will one day find the bull's eye of your hearts. And you will ask, why doesn't his poetry speak of dreams and leaves and the great volcanoes of his native land? Come and see the blood in the streets. Come and see the blood in the streets. Come and see the blood in the streets.
outside Cold Island called Kitty Bracken. In 1920, when he was six, his family moved to Dundalk. The border at that stage did not exist. They were just moving a few miles south. In 1929, his family moved to Dublin in 27, and in 1929, he was enrolled in arts in UCD. UCD, in Earlsford Terrace, was a staid place, very rigid, very Catholic, very right-wing, as indeed it remained until the move at least to Belfield. In 1931, Charlie began to take an active interest in politics, and 1931 was very like where we are today. In Wednesday's Financial Times, there were two different articles in different sections warning that this coming year, 2010, will be the year when the trade wars break out. We've had the first year and a half of the financial crisis, just as they'd had in 1929. And in 1931, the violence breaks out in trade. And the following year, the Hitlers arrive on the stage. And the year before Hitler showed his face at a national level and internationally, young Charlie Donnelly, who was only 18, was warning of the Hitlers and of the meaning of the Mussolinis who were already in power. In 1932, he becomes interested in social activism because fascism and the forces for which it acts are already on the streets of Dublin. And the issue of landlords' evictions, close to us today, and the issue of trade unions being prohibited, even closer, are on the agenda. And Charlie begins going to jail as a social activist. In 1933, he has to repeat his year in UCD. Another good sign of somebody <laughs> whose mind is a little bit larger than the courses provided in that still conservative university. And in 1934, Charlie moves into full-time activism. And we have a remarkable development in Ireland. We have what in the continent would be called the popular front, the merging of all the strands of the liberal democratic centre and the different shades of the left, rural, industrial, Marxist, non-Marxist. And Ireland's popular front was called the Republican Congress. And it was an outgrowth of the Republican movement. Those who had fought the wars of independence and the civil war and had now realised the fight was not a fight with guns, it was about the issues for which they had fought. And the question was, what were those issues? And these people almost succeeded at an IRA delegate conference in winning a majority. And when they didn't, they moved ahead. Now these were experienced fighters, people who understood about hunger strikes, people who understood about mines and bombs and ambushes and being interrogated and tortured and suffering years in jail. And yet, a 20-year-old Charlie Donnelly, at their first formative meeting, is elected to the executive. This is some unusual guy. Charlie Donnelly is part of this strands with a young Communist Party, not always called that, with people who come from all strands of the IRA, who have moved into social struggle, and with members of unions and a left which hope to bring a Labour Party with them. And he starts going to jail and is jailed at least once a year for the next three years. At the end of it, he decides that there is very little future here in social activism. 
and he arrives in London and tells his friend that he joins the way we all do. We go to London, you look for the floor to sleep on, and what are you here for? He says, I couldn't stick it anymore, the stupidity of the place. He's left very brilliant people behind who have remained merely students on the left. Cyril Cusack, who lasted to our own days, notable figure, and remembers Charlie, and said, we went part of the way, Charlie went all the way. And you then say, what has Spain got to do with Charlie Donnelly? Charlie was analysing for himself the politics. He had that duty which we all have, and he worked very hard with a good brain, in the duty to think for yourself, to analyse the history in the streets around you, the news in the papers, and Charlie was predicting in 1935 that there would be a war within the next three or four years and that Britain's great friend in the Mediterranean, the Italian state of Mussolini, would be on the other side. Nobody in the British cabinet accepted or believed that for a moment. Nobody in the Foreign Office. And most people in Dublin would have seen a stable Catholic Mussolini state as an excellent model to be followed. And the following year, when the Civil War broke out in Spain, and when the Spanish Republic was abandoned by the democracies that it had structured itself on, by a democracy which was only trying to reform Spain in the way that the Irish land question had been reformed, for this was the great issue in Spain, the haves and the have-nots. But Franco's failed rebellion brought about the very revolution that Franco used as an excuse for his rebellion, when his coup failed, that revolution happened. And the Spanish church, in many, though not all parts of Spain, which had been a pillar of the repression, and the landlords, and the Guardia Civil, became an object of great anger for or against. And 7,000 clergy paid with their lives in often dramatic and brutal circumstances. What was happening outside the cities what the press were reporting, in the countryside and the small towns, was very often, in one third of Spain, the equally vicious triumph of the right. And there was one big difference. The revolution in Spain on the Republican side that produced massacres was a breakdown of law and order. On Franco's side, coming from the director of the coup, General Mola, it was the necessary repression. We must have terror. We must have liquidations. The intellectuals, the teachers, were a number one target. And last year in Spain, I sat for two hours with the child of one of those teachers. Her mother went to open the school in September because if she didn't, in Franco's conquered territory, that would definitely confirm she was a rojo, a red. She went to open the school in the little village and never came home. The father went to look for her. He was a teacher. He never came home. And a child of six, one of four and one of three, were left alone to cross the mountains and look for hands who would take them in. The teachers and the trade unionists and the ordinary party members on the left, not just declared Republicans, were a target. And they had no choice. And they decided to fight. And those were the people for whom the Charlie Donnellys went out. The extraordinary thing about Charlie Donnelly is that here the Republican Congress had done its two years of ploughing a lonely furrow and had found no Labour Party coming behind it, no big trade union support. And they said, look, in this wave of hysteria from the press and the church, we can't possibly back the Republic. And 22-year-old Charlie Donnelly came back to the hardened gunmen of Frank Ryan and Pather O'Donnell. IRA key names, and this 22-year-old student browbeats them into supporting the Spanish Republic. And that leads to 320 Irishmen from Ireland, Britain, and all over the world joining the international brigades. Some were already in Spain, but Charlie Donnelly says, no, you put the Republican Congress behind the Spanish Republic. And having done that, he went back to London and put himself behind that Republic. Not as a leader, not as a poet, not as a great political mind, but as one more soldier. And when he's killed on the 27th of February, 
at the Battle of Harama in 1937. He's with the Lincoln Brigade. He's with the Lincolns because the IRA and the others had felt aggrieved and very reasonably by the political presentation of their fight within the British Battalion. And Charlie and Peter O'Connor and others had voted against moving on the grounds that their unity with the British working class was the statement they needed to make. Charlie accepted the decision of the majority, even though it was politically wrong. And he becomes part of a Lincoln Brigade of virgin soldiers who are moved into machine guns on the 23rd of September, oh sorry, of February, and luckily survive that first engagement. But four days later on the 27th, it's a complete suicide attack. There are three lines of machine guns set up by the fascists. And in the olive groves where they advance, there's very little shelter. When you're out in these olive groves, you know, it's not bunches of trees. It's a tree, 20 meters, and a tree, 20 meters. There's virtually no shelter. And that's the battleground where those fellows had to advance and die. And that was the last attack protecting the vital lifeline of the city of Madrid. And Madrid was the only place in the world where an organized government was trying to fight the steady fascist takeover of Europe, which had continued almost unchecked except for the people of Vienna in 1934. Everybody else was backing down, handing over. Well, they're doing our job. They're not the sort of people we'd have to dinner, but they're looking after the workers and they're making sure those reds stay in the box. Very useful people. And the Charlies were those who could see where those very useful people were taking us. And if we're not careful in our day, people like that who are still there will do what they think is necessary in the next few years. So when we remember Charlie Donnelly, we remember our own needs and our own day. The people who brought you together are basically people from Kilibraki and Dungannon who put up a stone very like this about 100 yards from the family home and have gone out for three years and organized with the town of Rivas and the Friends of the International Brigade in Spain, the presenting in a park called Miral Rio in Rivas Vasque, Madrid, which is the largest new town in the area of the battlefield of Rama, a stone to be put up not just for Charlie, but for all those who died in that area for the Spanish Republic. And for those of you going out or thinking of it, of the 22nd, sorry, 27th of February, which is a Saturday, We'll also have a lecture beforehand on the Friday. The stone unveiled on the Saturday and a battlefield tour of Brunetti on the Sunday. The stone is being financed by you. There was hope of getting council support officially and many councillors in Dungannon are supporting this and some will be travelling. Many people from Dublin will be here. There are people here tonight from Dundalk where that family lived, from Killybracky, from Coal Island, and uh, almost from UCD. And there are yourselves representing a similar broad strand of many complex Irish traditions which once before came together in the Republican Congress. There are 32 stones from Ireland being brought out and there will be similar number of stones from the Harama battlefield. And for this we are sincerely grateful to all of you. Thank you.
He came from the shipyard that stands o'er the Clyde. His hammer lies idle, his tools laid aside. To the broad Ebro River, young Foyers has gone to fight by the side of the people of Spain. There was not his equal at work or at play. He was strong in the union until his dying day. He was grand at the football and the dance he was grand. Because he fought for freedom, he was forced to flee his home. Near the bloodstained Manthana Harris, where the fight to hold Madrid was fought, died Hans the Commissarupo, died Hans the Commissar. A bullet came a-flying from his fascist fatherland. The aim was true, the shot struck on the rifle barrel, well made to a German army gun, a German army gun. With hand on heart we pledge you as we load our guns again. You will never be forgotten, nor the enemy forgiven. Hans Beimler, our commissar, oh, Hans Beimler, our commissar. Viva la Quisera, no pastor and the flesh that made them fight. Adelante is the cry around his side. Let us all remember them tonight. This song is a tribute to Frank Ryan. Kid Conway and Vinny Cody too. Peter Daly, Charlie Reagan, and Hugh Bonner. Though many died, I can but name a few. Danny Boyle, Blazer Brown, and Charlie Donnelly. Liam Tomlinson and Jim Strainey from The Voice. Jack Nalty, Tommy Patton, and Frank Conway. Jim Foley, Tony Fox, and Dick O'Neill. Viva la Quisera No pass around the flesh that's made of fight Adelante is the cry around the hillside Let us all remember that in tonight Viva la Quisera No pass around the flesh that's made of fight Adelante is the cry around the hillside. Let us all remember them
Yeah. Right. Give me a couple more for the front end here. 